Today we are starting a new sermon series called Courage. We're going to spend the next six weeks or so studying the book of Esther, and many of us, I think most of us probably have heard the story of Esther, and certainly she is the main focus of this book. Certainly the one who had to have really the most courage in this Old Testament book. But as we unpack this account in the Bible, we're also going to see that there were more than a few people in this book of Esther who had courage in the face of some pretty challenging and even life-threatening situations. If you want to go ahead and follow along with me, if you want to open up your Bibles or your Bible app, I'm going to be in the first chapter of Esther today. That's where I'm going to be. So I'm going to read a a portion of it in a little bit, um, but that's what I'll be talking about. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase or anyone has ever said to you, everything happens for a reason. It's something people often say when someone is going through a rough time. And I think we like to think of this phrase as maybe even comforting, like a comforting statement when someone is going through significant struggles or even loss in their life. As a hospital chaplain, I would often hear people say this to me. And sometimes even people would say it about their own personal health struggles. Like there must be a reason for my suffering. And we sometimes try to make sense of our situation. Maybe even, uh, maybe even we, we try to find comfort in thinking that maybe the pain that we are experiencing is all part of some great cosmic plan that God has for us. But I think if we really think about this statement. This, this saying, I, don't, I would say, I don't think it's all that comforting. At least, personally, I don't think it is. I don't think it's all that comforting to think God planned for me to have cancer when my kids were small and it took a real hard toll on my family. Or for someone who is experiencing a diagnosis of like a severely life altering illness. Like, I don't think it's really comforting to think that God somehow had a hand in a death of a very young child, or any child for that matter. Nobody wants to lose a child. I'll admit, I don't think it's really comforting to think God somehow had a hand in maybe a job loss that you experienced and that that he is somehow involved in the fact that maybe now you haven't been able to find a job for months and you're not sure how you're going to be able to pay rent next month? I think we think the saying, everything happens for a reason, seems comforting, and so we say it, but friends, I'd like to submit to you that I'm not sure that it really is. And truthfully, I think that the place that we get this saying from is found in Scripture. But I think we kind of look at it wrong, like we read it wrong when we say it like that. Like we, sh- we, we sometimes take Scripture, we kind of shorten it up, and it doesn't get the full meaning behind it. In Romans 8.28, it says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this is actually going to be our memory verse. Like we've been doing a memory verse for our sermon series. This is going to be the one because it really applies to what we're learning here in Esther. But here's the deal about this verse, friends. It doesn't say God causes bad things to happen to us, right? Like if we read this, if we were to really kind of read this straight from the Greek, it would say something like God works all things together for good. What it doesn't say is that he somehow causes the bad things to happen to you. What it does say is that he is able to redeem and give reason to our suffering. God is able to work bad things out for good because he loves us. That is what it is saying. 
here's what we should be saying, if anything. And I'll be honest, I've been a hospital chaplain. Sometimes the best thing, if someone is suffering, is not to say anything about, like, theology. Uh, it's best just to listen and say, I care about you, and just listen. Because sometimes in the midst of the real pain and suffering, like, we try to find solutions, and the best thing is just to be with someone. But I think if we were going to say anything, if we were going to think anything in our mind, too, when we see horrible suffering, is that God can give reason and redemption to everything you experience. God can take terrible, no good, rotten situations, and he can give reason to them. So that when you look back at a horrible situation, maybe you had cancer, you could see the way God walked with you through that situation. That you can look back and see how he really did sustain you in your pain. Or maybe you lost a child at a young age, and even though it was a horrific experience in your life, you could see the way people really rallied around you and your family. And, and they were the hands and feet of Jesus to you in a really awful situation. You could see the way God could redeem at least some of that terrible situation you experienced. God redeems what we thought was lost, and he redeems our brokenness. And even if we never really fully feel whole again, we know we eventually will, right? That's his promise to us to redeem us fully someday. We cling to that hope that even if we don't see full redemption to our suffering, someday we have the hope of complete healing and complete restoration. And so friends, as we start this series on Esther, this is what we have to keep in the front of our minds through this whole thing. God is able to redeem really horrible situations. I don't believe he causes the pain. I actually think we're really good enough at that on our own. And in our broken world, we just live in a broken world, right? But what I do see is that he loves us no matter how far or near we are to him. And he can take our horrible decisions, our bad experiences, our moral failings, and he can redeem them. He can give reason to what seemed absolutely senseless. And as we study Esther, our big takeaway of this entire book is that God can take terrible situations and not so great decisions, and he can redeem them. He can make sense of them. The second thing I think that we might pick up as we study this book is that it feels like God is absent at times in this whole story. Like, one aspect about the book of Esther that you might not know, but not once does the word God ever appear in the pages of Esther. And at times, the moral ambiguity and the violence, it certainly feels void of anything godly. There's extreme excess. There's drama. There's manipulation. There's fear. There's decisions based on an extreme abuse of power. It reads honestly like a regular 80s soap opera with a tad bit more excess and violence, right? Like if you read it, that's what it sounds like. But God was not absent. He was not gone. God was taking a terrible situation and bringing about redemption for his people, the people that he loved. Just like he can bring reason and redemption to your story. God at times, I know, God at times it feels absent. You just want to throw up your hands and be like, where are you, God? Where are you in this situation? Where are you in this suffering? But friends, I believe he's very much present in our human suffering. I mean, even just the knowledge that Jesus came to know what we experience. He knows our suffering. He's not absent. It's not that he doesn't know. The third thing I think that we should know as we start our study on Esther is that the book is not a fairy tale. I think at times we like to dress it up like that. 
a Disney, like a Disney princess movie. I have a few slides to show you. Here we go. I mean, it's not this, okay? This is not, like, it's not happy. It's not a happy story. I mean, it does have a happy ending, but mm-mm. No king, like, sweeps the, the princess off her feet. We dress it up like that sometimes. Um, the, you know, the prince doesn't sweep the young maiden off her feet. Next slide. This is not it, okay? If this is what you grew up on and you saw, I don't know. I haven't seen the movies, but I think that there are some more movies. Now, what movie I have seen is this one. Um, because my kids grew up on this. And I want you to know, if you grew up on this, and this is how you learned the story of Esther, the king did not ask her to make a sandwich. That is the sanitized kids version. And so we have a whole bunch of kids growing up thinking that the king just asked her to make a sandwich. Okay? I'm going to tell you what happens, like if you don't know what he asked her to do. That's not the story. This is not a good person. He's not a hopeless romantic. He's a power-hungry, immature king who wreaks havoc on powerless and marginalized people. King Xerxes lives a life of excess. He has complete power. He is highly influenced by the people around him, which is actually why actually the Jewish people were actually saved in the end of this story. Sorry to, to give you the ending already. He was highly prone to lack his own thoughts. He didn't, I don't want to say that he was dumb, but he is not portrayed as highly intelligent. And there's a a reason. It it actually has a lot of dark comedy in it. He's not compassionate. Nothing about this Persian king Xerxes should be glorified in any way. He disposes of his first queen and he sleeps with a hundred or hundreds, I'm not even sure the amount, in order to find the next queen just one night and disposes of them. So with that background, we sh- we're going to unpack the first chapter of Esther. I'm going to read the whole, or I'm going to read part of the, whole, of the first chapter. Um, I'm not, um, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happens, and then I'm going to invite you this week, I'd like to challenge you to go and read Esther this week. It's 10 chapters. Some of the chapters are actually really pretty, pretty short. But it will give you kind of a good framework as we unpack this book and we talk about about it over the next few weeks. So that's my challenge to you. So Esther opens up with a full understanding of what it was like in Persia at that time and the unbelievable excess in the royalty at the time in Persia. This is what the author wants us to know and is setting up for us, the extent of the excess and the opulence of the Persian royal court of that day. Persia is the leading world power at that time, although even as we read the pages of Esther, a new world power is brewing. And eventually the Greeks will take over in world domination, and this is part of his power hunger, because he knows this. There's, There's some things going on. Persia is known for its unbelievable excess and wealth. And the whole first part of this chapter speaks towards that. It says that King Xerxes holds a feast of some sort, uh, probably like a very long festival for six months. This was in the third year of his reign. But at the end of the six months, he holds another one that is even more elaborate, and that lasts for seven days. The author describes the opulence of this great festival in detail. Silver rings, marble posts, purple crystal, the works. They didn't hold back. The Persians were known for their over-the-top affluence, and this king does not hold back. If you're with me, if you're looking at this, notice in verse 7 what it says. I want to point out that at their party, instead of red solo cups with uh, a sharpie, they just made every single cup of gold, and they made it different so that they knew for seven days this was their cup right? No one got confused of which cup theirs theirs was, but it was made of gold. No red solo cups for them. So now it's been seven days of drinking and partying with all the high-ranking officials in Persia, and we're going to read together. I'm going to start at verse 10. 
Oh, thought I had my glasses. Oh, man. Thought I had them on my head. <laughs> are those readers? They are? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, good. Here we go. On the, thank you so much. I read so much better with these. On the seventh day, when wine had put the king in high spirits, he gave an order to a bunch of uh, eunuchs who served King Xerxes. Uh, uh, he also is known by King Xerxes, and I'm going to say that because it's easier for me. Personally, they were to bring Queen Vashti before him wearing the royal crown. She was gorgeous, and he wanted to show off her beauty both to the general public and to his important guests. But Queen Vashti refused to come as the king had ordered through the eunuchs. The king was furious, his anger boiling inside. Now when a need rose, arose, the king would often talk with certain very smart people about the best way to handle it. They were people who knew both the kingdom's written laws and what judges had decided about cases in the past. The ones he talked about with most often were um, a group of guys that I'm not going to list. They were seven very important people in Persian media who, as the kingdom's highest leaders, were in the king's inner circle. So the king said to them, according to, this, to the law, what should I do with Queen Vashti since she didn't do what the king Xerxes ordered her through the eunuchs? The Memucan spoke up in front of the king and the officials. Queen Vashti, he said, has done something wrong, not just to the king himself. She has also done wrong to all the officials and the people in all the province of King Xerxes. This is the reason. News of the queen did, um, news of what the queen did will reach all women. They're really worried about this. Making them look down on their husbands. And they will say, King Xerxes ordered servants to bring Queen Vashti before him, but she refused to come. This very day, the important women of Persia and media who hear about the queen will tell the royal officials the same thing. There will be no end of put-downs and arguments. Now, if the king wishes, let him send out a royal order and have it written. So, um, so let's, not just, like, let's not just be embarrassed here, right here. We're going to go ahead and send this royal order. We're going to tell what happened to the entire like, Persia from northern Africa up to the Black Sea over to Asia. Let's just tell everybody what happened so we can make sure the women stay in their places. It should say that Vashti will never again come before King Xerxes. It should also say that the king will give her royal place to some, someone better than she. When the order becomes public, though, the, through the whole empire, vast as it is, all women will treat their husbands properly. The rule should touch everyone, whether from an important family or not. The king liked this plan. I am so glad that you see the humor. So, the, like, they're, like the, theologians say, this is really, like, the author's being humorous here. Like, as did the other men. And he did just what Memucan said. He, he sent writ, a written order to all the king's provinces. Each province received it written in its own alphabet, and each people received it in its own language. It said that each husband should rule over his own house. So now, this is the end of the six months of lavish feasts and the festivals and seven days of heavy drinking. And what does the king do who has shown his heads of state and his advisors everything that he has and all the amazing affluence and influence that he has when he's shown them everything? He then turns to his wife, right? Right? And he orders his eunuchs to bring Queen Vashti with only her crown on before hundreds of men. And what does she say? No. No. And I know I've been setting the stage to understand Esther a bit better so you can see what's really going on as we dig deeper. But I want to look at Vashti a little bit more in our time together. So I think she's overlooked sometimes in this story. She's a significant piece of chapter one. And I want to discuss briefly about her and what she kind of brings to the discussion and what she brings to what maybe you want to chew on this week. Queen Vashti is actually a blip in this larger story of Esther. Sometimes we glide right over her. 
Some people like to villainize her. It maybe makes the idea of Esther replacing her as queen go down easier. They point out that she was Babylonian and she supposedly hated the Persian king and would have said no to anything that he would have asked her to do. She supposedly hated Jews, was part of the plot against the Jews. That's what they, they like to say. Some, some people believe that. But honestly, I don't see that here, and I'm not sure that we can know that for sure. Sadly, some Christian writings have made Vashti a poster child for not being a good submissive wife, and that she got what she deserved. And I just say, yuck to that. That you should raise up a man asking his wife to walk around naked. Yet others go the opposite way and hold Vashti up as the first feminist of the Bible, and they maybe read into things that aren't there as well. I'm not sure her decision to say no had anything to do with maybe her, what she thought were rights as women. I'll be honest, I don't really know why Vashti said no. You know, maybe she had been asked to do so many humiliating things that she had enough. We don't know for sure. But I am going to take a wild guess. I'm going to tell you what I think. I think it had probably something to do with fear. I would think most women would find parading around in front of a bunch of men who'd been drinking for seven days, who may or may not de decide to have their way with you, would certainly be a factor. I don't think the king, and she knew this, was in any kind of place to make a good decision when it came to how his wife was going to be treated if she showed up wearing only her crown. Some scholars would also say that Vashti, most likely in her right mind and not, had not been drinking, would have known the law that the king even wrote that significantly limited who could see the queen. Legally, she had only a few people who could really actually see her, that she could be seen by, and hundreds of strangers would have been forbidden in this culture. She actually probably knew the law and knew that this was not a win-win situation for her. She could show herself naked tonight and tomorrow when the king was no longer drunk, she would be punished for what she did. Or she could hold her dignity and be punished for what she didn't do. I think you would agree, Vashti kind of had an impossible choice. She could not win, I think, regardless. So honestly, reading and studying this book and reading about Vashti, I think we can't say for certain why she said no. When I read this, what I do see is a king with excess of power and unhealthy boundaries and a queen who appears, by all accounts, to actually have healthy boundaries, and who says no to being abused and being made part of a game. I also see the way her choice to uphold her integrity and her self-respect and to say no took an incredible, probably an incredible amount of courage. But let's be honest, her willingness to set boundaries were what set this whole thing, this whole story in motion and gave God room to eventually redeem his people right? And so as we're wrapping up today, I just want to touch up on, on boundaries because I think one thing that Vashti teaches us is that healthy boundaries are okay. God can still work through a no. How we can choose health for ourselves by helping people know where they start and end and where you start and end. And healthy boundaries keep relationships healthy, they keep churches healthy, they keep marriages healthy. I think even sometimes in the church we think, well, if I say no, no one will do it, right? Like, and honestly, this is a struggle for me, to be quite honest. It's, it's hard for me to say, well, that just isn't going to happen until someone steps up. Or sometimes we feel like 
someone puts expectations on us and we try to live up to those expectations, but it wears us out. And in the end, we feel unhealthy and burned out. We said yes because of guilt or something else and it has worn us out. We take on unhealthy burdens of other people's junk or their expectations. You know, no one made, maybe no one asked you to walk around naked with a crown on, but I think you might know what it's like to be on the receiving end of someone's unhealthy expectations of you. But Queen Vashti serves to remind us that our no can still be used by God. Our ability to do self-care and have self-respect and to set healthy boundaries is okay. And you can say no when you feel like you have been given, or if you have been, you've given as much as you can possibly give. Or you're being asked to do something that you just can't do. This is healthy and it's okay to care for yourself. What we will see in this story is that Vashti's no made space for a new queen who was brought up for such a time as this, right? Like that's the famous verse we mo- most of us know from Esther when Esther's uncle says, maybe God has brought you to this place as queen for such a time as this. Maybe our no makes space for someone to grow or to try something new, as painful as it might be, or even the amount of courage it takes for you to say no and to step back or ask for more help. Your no might not feel good. It might make you sad. It might make someone else sad or frustrated with you. It may make you feel left out, but your no might mean in the long run you are healthier because of it, because you chose to set healthy boundaries. If nothing else, Vashti teaches us that caring for ourselves and our dignity and our worth is okay, and that at the end of the day, If self-care means that you need to say no, you need to say no. And it's okay. But friends, it also teaches us to be careful and mindful of unhealthy expectations we may be putting on someone else. What are we expecting of someone that we wouldn't expect of ourselves? And that's the kicker. Like Boundaries are more than you just knowing your space and your no. It's knowing and allowing space for someone else and honoring their space and their no as well. Friends, I believe Vashti's no in this chapter one is an invitation for us to be reminded of what healthy boundaries look like. And be reminded of what healthy boundaries look like in relationships. And even take a moment to examine our own relationships and improve when it comes to setting boundaries and giving space for others to set them as well for their health too. Friends, there are a lot of pieces to this account of Esther and the way the Jews were eventually saved from genocide. I guess I hope that I've given you enough information that when you go home this week that you'll reread Esther and really kind of dig into it as we look at it together over the next several weeks. But friends, as we close up today, be reminded that God is in the redemption business. That he loves you, he has a plan for you, and sometimes it may feel like he's absent. We don't understand how he could possibly redeem our broken places and spaces. But God is in the redemption business, and we see it over and over again through history as God cares for the Jews, and he redeems their mistakes and their hopelessness over and over again, including here in Esther. He does not want pain and suffering for you. I believe that. He weeps with you in your pain. He waits with you in your pain. He grieves the suffering and the brokenness of this world, but he can redeem, I believe he can redeem the worst of situations. And even if you always carry brokenness in you from experiences that you have had, which many of us have, he is still our hope. That someday all crying will cease, 
all suffering, all brokenness will cease. The book of Revelation reminds us that despite the terrible power that the world empires hold, despite the pain and suffering of this world, despite the fallenness of this world, the true king of kings will have victory, victory over all of these things. We are called as Christ followers to live faithfully to that day and, we have, and to have courage in the face of brokenness and do the best we possibly can with what we've been given. Will we always make the right decisions? Probably not. Will we have to make decisions concerning moral ambiguous things? Probably. Just like we see Esther has to. Will we have to make decisions concerning our health and how much we can handle in this difficult world? Yes, we will. Will we need courage to face our difficult and, and very broken world? Yes, we will. But through the pages of Scripture and in this account of Esther, we see the way God loves and redeems broken people. He may, at times, it may feel like he's silent. He may feel absent at times. But friends, I submit to you, I don't think that he is. I think he's there in our suffering. He is the God who loves and redeems the most impossible situations. And I believe he can redeem what seems impossible to you as well. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the book of Esther that reminds us in the midst of chaos and brokenness in our world and things that we really sometimes have no control over that you are there, that you can redeem the worst of situations, that you can sometimes even bring reason to sometimes our hardest situations, that you don't want these things to happen to us, that you don't cause these things, but at the same time, you can bring hope. You can bring healing. You can bring restoration, and you can redeem us. And Lord, I just pray that we would cling to that as we study Esther in the coming weeks. We just pray this in your name. Amen.